Welcome to the Top Business Leader Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Chad Franzen here, co-host of the Top Business Leaders Show, where we feature CEOs, entrepreneurs, and top leaders in the business world. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. We help B2B businesses reach their dream relationships and connect with more clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships and get ROI through Done For You podcasts. If you have a B2B business and want to build great relationships, there's no better way than to profile the people and companies you admire on your podcast. To learn more, go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25.com. Paul Ratner is a veteran in B2B sales and revenue generation. Currently, he works for a private lender that offers growth capital to small, small commercial businesses. Prior to this role, Paul worked nearly two decades in professional sports while having various business advisor roles. Paul, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? Great. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Same here. Hey, so uh, as I mentioned, you work for a private lender, and it is called Marble Bridge Funding Group. Tell me more about about Marble Bridge and kind of what they do and what makes them unique. Yeah, I'll I'll preface with this in that I've been working in this industry for about five months. So uh, hopefully I sound like I'm pretty smart for how much I know in that (laughs) time frame. That's okay. We'll keep that in mind. (laughs) Yeah, but uh, we actually, you know, we're a company that was started by an entrepreneur, right? 25 years ago. And his whole ethos was to help uh, people get funding that don't have access to capital that need it for their business and their business owners. So we we specifically work with commercial-based companies. So I have an expertise in B2B sales. This was translatable for me in that I'm working with companies that are trying to grow B2B businesses. Um, the way it works more or less and the way we work with customers is we actually find strategic financing solutions for them against future revenues that they're forecasting going forward. I think most lenders look at your history as opposed to what your lending opportunity is going forward. So yeah, we're in a higher risk business, um, but this is kind of the the line, you know, the ethos in our mission statement. We want to help people that don't have access to capital. So uh, you've been there for about five months um, as vice president of sales. What are kind of your primary responsibilities day to day? We we actually do a little bit of everything here. Um, so I'm actually networking with a lot of bankers and I'm working with them on customers that they're talking to on a daily basis that may bank with them, but they may not be able to lend to, um, right? So we're partnering with a lot of the banks um, as well as CPA firms, CFOs, advisors, um, finding ways to be able to help their companies. And it may not just be for lending, right? I will use my expertise on any level to be able to help people. Um, and that's what I love best about this job. The next part about it that I think makes our role unique, most bankers usually have an underwriting team or a team of people that do things for them. We do everything, right? So I will work with them. I will underwrite. So I will know and understand their business from top to bottom, um, as well as the risk profile of of what we're helping somebody with. I know that uh, sales and sales management has been a very big part of your career. As I mentioned, you also work in sports, but a lot of that was, you know, in in a sales type role. What are some things you find most enjoyable about that type of work? Yeah, sports. I loved sports, right? Like I grew up playing sports. So I always wanted to work in sports when I realized I wasn't going to be a professional athlete. And I think Mm -hmm. you talk to most people that work in that industry. That is kind of what it is. Uh, I think a lot of people go into that too, looking for the glitz, the glamour and meeting people that you always aspired to meet. And I think probably in my first handful of years doing it, that got kind of old for me. Um, I didn't care about that aspect of it as much. I actually grew to love talking to CEOs. I love talking to business owners. And I think when you when you talk to the athlete or a young kid, right? Uh, your, your almost excitement when you're talking to them is like, oh, they were nice to me. <laughs> and I, I, I think when you get in business and you, you're in sales, the, the premise of it is like people buy from people they like. And I believe the same from the sales perspective of it. Um, and when you're doing that type of thing, if you're in broadcasting in sports, right, like you don't necessarily get to just talk to the people you like. There's people you have to talk to. Uh, and, and I think that was something that I didn't want to do. Um, but that was initially where I was going. Right. I wanted to go into broadcasting kind of like you're doing here. Yeah, I got I, I mean, my 
my degree was in radio and television. So that was, that was the angle I was going for when I realized I wasn't going to play, but I ended up liking the sales and business side of it more. And it's quite fascinating uh, to be in the business side of sports, especially when you're a fan. It, it, there, there's so much behind the scenes that people just don't know about how it's run um, and how much of it, it it's a business. What kind of, uh, to be successful in sales, whether it's sports or, or what you're doing now, is there kind of a mindset you need to have? You said people buy from people they like. How do you, how do you approach that when you know, like, do you have to put aside your desire to complete the transaction uh, in order to be successful in sales? Yeah, I actually think like, uh, I'll answer this question somewhat differently is I think about who I hire. Mm-hmm. The two characteristics I look for the most when I'm hiring somebody is number one, do they care and do they work hard? And my question sets when I'm interviewing somebody are usually focused on those two things. And I can tell you from the other side of it is when you go talk to somebody and have lunch with them and you talk to them about their business or whatever other things they're interested in, you can pick up pretty quickly whether they care or they're there to clock in and clock out. And I think if you're gonna be really successful in sales, in sports or any industry, you have to be passionate about it. You have to care about it. Um, if you don't care, the other side of the table, they're going to be able to see through it. And it's just, it's really hard to be successful if you don't. So you, uh, you worked in, you've worked in sports for, you know, much more than a decade. Uh, I believe you worked for the Golden State Warriors twice. And then for, so adding the two together for about 15 years, a little bit more than 15 years. You also worked for the PGP. How did you get started with the Warriors? And did you do so as a, just a desire to work in, out of a desire to work in sports, or did you want to get into sales? This is actually a pretty good story. <laughs> so I wanted to work in sports first and foremost. Uh, so I, I got some advice when I was in college, right? I majored in radio and television, and the advice I got was you need to pick a lane, right? How you're going to get into sports, there's a lot of people that want a very small amount of jobs. You're going to have to work your way through it and figure out how you're going to get there. And I think this was like my sophomore year. And then the summer in my junior year of college, I was just like, okay, I'm going to focus by getting in any way I can. I don't care if it's TV or the business side. I knew the business side would be easier because there's more jobs. So I started taking business classes and I said, I'm going to go try to get in with a team any way I could. Uh, So the first thing I did, I I love basketball. That's the sport I played. I just called the Warriors 1-800 number and I said, I want to work for free. Who do I talk to? And my mindset in doing that was everybody calls in and says, do you have any internships available? In most cases, some people want to negotiate, like, do I get paid? How do I get course credit or those types of things? For me, it became, I want to shock them immediately. I want to tell them very clearly that I want to be there and I'm willing to do it for free. Um, And today, like California labor laws, right? Like nobody can do that now. It's not even, it's not legal. (laughs) <laughs> and right. I think probably even what I was doing was probably, it was fine because I ended up getting course credit, but I think uh, it, teams would just never do that nowadays. But I eventually got to the right person and uh, I didn't know what his job was. They just transferred me to somebody that hired the interns and he told me to send my resume in and I harassed him. <laughs> and by harassed him, I had diligent follow-up. I was persistent. And uh, I think he automatically pegged me for a sales role when I, when I did that. And, uh, that, that landed me the internship. So you, you had an internship where you worked for free for course credit. Yeah, I did it for six months actually. Um, so I, I actually ended up doing course credit in two different programs in my time there, but because I was more than one class worth of work, but, uh, I, I, I kind of got a little more, um, ballsy if you say, or, uh, the other term, I, I would just say, I, I, you know, said I should try and get paid at this point. I've been here six months. I've been working 20, 30 hours a week. I need to get paid. So I just went and told him that. And then he said he didn't have any money for me. So I ended up walking. Uh, and that was about six months into it. And then uh, this time they traded for Baron Davis while I was gone. Mm-hmm. And I called him excited about them trading for Baron Davis because I loved watching him play. I loved him as a player. And I told him, what a great move for you guys. And then he told me to come in. And then he hired me part-time uh, when, I was, when I was still in college. So I, I kind of worked my way up um, in, from in there. What role, was, in what role was that? Sorry. 
I was, uh, they call it a ticket sales representative. So short term in the sports industry, they call it a TSR. Mm-hmm. Um, where the role was basically going in, I got paid hourly in commission. And I would go in a room that had no windows, one computer, just 10 people. We had sheets of paper of people that bought tickets over two years plus ago. So they were they were the bottom of the barrel leads. Um, but you had names and phone numbers and email was just starting to become more prominent around this time. People started doing that a little more. So I brought my own computer in because they only had one computer in the room. Um, and I was tracking my leads, calling people. And you make 120, 140 calls a day. Um, you hear people say that, but like I, I was I was legit doing it. <laughs> wow. So uh, what was your, what, what, out of 100 and let's say you made 120 calls on a day. What did you expect to have anything come out? Like, what was the percentage of calls that you expected to have, you know, something develop out of? Gosh, it's a great question. Um, I'd probably say I would hope out of 140, 120 calls in a day that I would hope that I got one to two warm leads that day. Wow. Wow. So what was the they, key to your, uh, like, what kind of mindset did you have to have going in each day? And how did you end up kind of, I know you had several jobs during your time with the Warriors. How did you end up getting to the next step? You know, that sounds like a pretty kind of tedious situation. Yeah. Uh, it, the really, the the call process, right? Your goal, you had to know every goal that you wanted in every moment. So if you called somebody and they answered, the goal was to get them to put their take their wall down and engage with you. So then you could figure out, like, is there an opportunity to actually offer them something that they may want to purchase? So that was step one. If they didn't pick up the phone and you left a voicemail, you had to know the goal was to get them to call you back. I still tell people this to this day. They email, cold email people, send in LinkedIn messages, leave you voicemails, send text messages. The goal is to get them to call you back. And I think people forget about that. They, they try to sell the voicemail or sell their product before they even have anyone on the other side talking. You have to think about the method of communication when you talk about sales at all times. If you're the one talking the whole time, that's not communication. <laughs> so the, the key to it is to make sure that they're engaging on the other side. I think when you think about that 120, 140 calls, that is the hardest part for somebody to grasp. And I think once that clicks, the other part I think is much easier, which is having gen- generic general conversation, right? Just um, be a human. Sure. So to yeah. get them to call you back, do you just say, hey, uh, call in the chat. We have some sale. We have some tickets for you. Well, like, What was the best way to do it? Yeah, you'd want to go into it and do a little research, actually. Um, at that time, when you're making 140 calls a day, you wouldn't do that. Today, I would try and do a little more research. So to go backtrack on those days where I didn't do research, all I would have is a name, a phone number, and a seat location. Yeah. And like once LinkedIn started getting more prominent, I would start looking up who they were and what their job was. You just want to have a one-line teaser in there of some sort, right? Um, like, for example, if I called Chad, I said, Hey, Chad, Paul Ratner with Marble Bridge Funding Group running a podcast tomorrow talking about Rise 25. Like, you'd be like, like, why is he talking about me? Why is he talking about Rise 25? So the idea would just to try and get a response. Mm. Um, and, and you know, you don't lie. You don't say anything that you're not doing. Um, you want to be authentic. You want to be honest. Um, so that's the key to it. Uh, so I think that's that's kind of how I approach those voicemails. And when I just had information about what game they went to, where their seats were, right? Like I might say, hey, so-and-so who you saw to last year is coming tomorrow or next week. That would that would be some of the the information, I would say. Or if we had discounts or something that, you know, maybe they'd be interested in. So there's a lot of people who kind of take, you know, entry-level jobs with sports teams and then they, you know, burn out or they move on. They move on to something else. What was your key to moving up from the the no window room where you have to make 120 calls to, <laughs> to, you know, obviously a very, a very good role with the team. Yeah. Uh, be the best in the room. Uh, even if you weren't like try to be care to be, be passionate about it. Uh, that was, that was my goal was to always compete and make sure that I was trying to be the, 
the best at my job in the room. And I think that's something that people like about hiring people that played sports in the sales roles, right? They're competitive, naturally. I am probably one of the most competitive people you will ever meet. If I have free time, I want to compete in something. I will play cards. I will play video games. I will play a board game. I will go shoot hoops in the backyard. I love eating. <laughs> so I think that that was kind of my, my thought process behind it and how I was approaching it. And I think I proved myself in my internship, right, with the right people, uh, that I understood our business, that I knew how to succeed. I knew how to help the company generate more money. So I think they believe that. And then when I was able to prove it in a short period of time, it allowed me to move up. Um, so they did hire me part time. And I, when I graduated from college, I actually got hired full time that like that day. Uh, and then I was out of hourly on a salary. And that moment, I, I, same thing, I had the same thought process of trying to be the best that I could be. And I'll tell you, like being a dad of two boys now, like that culture, that environment, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to hack it now. Right. Like I, it's a, I don't want to say it's a young person's game, but it can mentally be mentally draining. Sure. I bet. What, uh, was there, was there a, uh, difference in the product when you're selling the product, obviously when you were there, when, when they, before, before Baron Davis and even with Baron Davis would be different than when they had, you know, the, the current edition, Steph Curry and these guys, was there a big difference in your abilities that, I mean, in your, um, in the way your yeah. abilities may have looked, even though the product was so much different. It's funny. Um, I'd like to admit that's what I thought was my best asset. There is that I was steady. Um, I, I did pretty well in whatever environment we were in. I always tried to just ignore where the team was, right? Like control what you can control. Um, I was selling a product that was very public, that was in the newspaper, that everybody was talking about. Everyone had an opinion. And uh, I always tried to focus on what I could control, which was the asset we were selling, the product, solving people's problems, which whether they won or lost on the court, right? Like how they utilize the ticket to go to the game. The result was the same. They just might have enjoyed it more when you were winning. So like I, I the questions, what you were trying to do was all the same. Uh, and I always kept it that way. I always tried to keep it steady. I had some colleagues that would work with me and always just tell me to keep it even keel. Uh, and that was actually a very good learning lesson from one of my colleagues that was there in, in the industry longer than me. He, uh, he, he had a good mindset with that stuff. And I knew I needed to have it because I went through a lot of ups and downs with the team there. And my most recent stint there, I wrote a lot of, a lot of highs, obviously mm -hmm. that just made it more fun. Uh, sure. but <laughs> is there a, uh, is there a, a difference when it comes to your approach to selling, you know, whatever, whatever it is, party suites or a, a sports experience, as opposed to other sales, maybe sales like you're doing now? Yeah. I think, uh, when you think about consumer sales and business sales, they're, they're very different, right? Like a, a consumer sale you know, Chad wants to buy season tickets or wants to go to a handful of games. Like I'm eliciting your passions, your emotions to justify the purchase. Uh, there's, there's not really a rational reason for you to say, I want to have season tickets. That's going to benefit you monetarily, financially in any way. It's because you enjoy it. It's purely an emotional buy. Um, the business sale which is completely different, which is where I got really good and where I really understood how this business worked and how they could help companies when I was in sports. That was how I, I was able to actually leverage rational thinking and rational business decisions and how you would leverage this business to be able to help your company generate more money or to generate more sales or more relationships that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. That part was, I think, the when I took it to the next level. And I, I actually was able to do that more so when I went left the Warriors and went to the PGA Tour and came back. I would actually argue the PGA Tour and the NBA in that time frame, this is like 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would argue that the NBA didn't really understand B2B sales, at least the team that I worked for. Because I think they were very much in the consumer fan mindset, even on the sponsorship side from what I saw. And there were some good people there. 
but I think it was always just eliciting the emotions rather than the rational business decision. When I went to the tour, I, I was on a fast course of, of stuff that I learned there that I never would have learned on the, the team side. Um, and no offense to them, I think it was just they never experienced it. It had a lot to do with how much things cost. You know, the, the stuff when I was first at the Warriors was pretty cheap in comparison um, yeah. to what it became and to what, what things cost in the golf industry. So uh, would you say you learned more or did you, would you say what you took, what you learned at the PGA Tour um, back to the Warriors and that was a key to your success in your second stint? Oh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I, I learned more there than, than I would have ever learned um, at the Warriors about selling to companies. And I'll give a lot of credit to the people that I worked with over at the PGA Tour. My my boss at that time, Tom Clark, um, you know, he had phenomenal relationships in a short period of time when he moved from Florida to the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and I learned a lot by watching how he did things um, and then how that company did things. I And... and the notes to the to the culture that I was working in, right? Like it was a very different culture, and I'm sure it's a very different culture today than it was in 2010. Uh, but I I I learned way more there than I I did in my first six years at the, at the Warriors. So when you came back to the Warriors, did they look at you like you were some sort of a re- revolutionary, like you had these new successful ideas, or what, it- did they just say, "Oh, you're doing, you're still doing your thing"? It was interesting when I came back, right? Because when I when I went back to the Warriors, they had a new ownership group, right? Mm-hmm. So I was there under the previous ownership group. And I think part of my thought process was uh, I, I started in the industry saying, hey, I want to get in any way I can. And then I started having my own opinions and my own moral code and my own ethos that I, what I cared about in my work, in my life. And I just, it wasn't the environment I wanted to be in anymore, which is part of the reason why I left. I ended up leaving the PGA tour because I was traveling a lot and I, my wife and I were about to have kids. Mm. So I wanted to find something local and I got advice from a lot of people about how much it had changed over there. So they, they were interested in having me come back. So I had some conversations and, and I believed that it had changed. I was actually initially hired in a management role where I was going to be a seller and a manager, which I could give you my opinion on that later. Uh, and then when I started selling, when I first came on, I, I was I was off to the races and they were just kind of like, why don't you just keep doing that? And I was fine with it because I, I knew I was going to do really well um, monetarily and for, for the company. And the goal was to go there and be a part of the new arena, right? Because when I went back there, they, they, they announced they were building a new arena in San Francisco. So I knew that's what I was there for. Uh, and that that's an experience like just people rarely get to get in sports. Not many people get to be a part of selling a new a new stadium in a top five market. Yeah, how was that? Uh, yeah, and it's unreal. It, it's such a fast paced environment. You'll know in the first six months when you start selling when you go to market if you're going to make it or not. And that's a nerve wracking thing. <laughs> if I'm you're sure. going to make the goal that you want and, and the reality of it, the hardest thing to figure out is what's the right pricing, mm-hmm. like understanding what's the right price for the market, something brand new that adds additional amenities and figuring out how to plan that out. Now, I wasn't as much a part of that planning process. I was a, a few of the things as I was actively, actively selling it. But I think this community in this, in the Bay area was, was salivating over that because a lot of pro sports stadiums are now built around communities that have restaurants and places to go where we were. And they played 47 seasons there in Oakland was literally on a blank canvas in a parking lot, great public transportation and a ton of parking. But I think a majority of people would love to say, Hey, I can go outside and continue engaging with my friends, my clients or doing something else rather than going out and there's literally nothing to do. Uh, in addition to that, just the way traffic works in the Bay Area, it's actually much harder to get to Oakland after work 
than it is to go to San Francisco because most people drive in this more people drive into San Francisco for work than they do to Oakland. So it was a reverse commute um, and getting in and out to go to events. Um, and I could tell you from experience, actually, it's it's easier. I live closer to Oakland and it's easier for me to go to San Francisco, which sounds crazy, but it just it's been faster both ways. <laughs> huh. That's that's very interesting. Um, did you find oh, uh, let's get back to you. You said you would elaborate more on doing management and sales. Yeah, so the the management piece, um, there's a lot of times in sales where you don't want to take your best seller off the line, quote unquote, right? And putting them in a management role. So you kind of keep them in it, mm-hmm. but like give them that management role maybe so they can keep going um, and, and give them some elevation to recognize them in some way. Uh, in, in pro sports, it's, I, I don't know a team that hasn't done it that way. They just always do that. I I don't like it. Uh, I don't believe in having someone manage a team that's compensated on what they sell as well. I don't want to eat my team's lunch. I'm there to help them grow. Um, and I fully believe in doing that. And I think there's a his- history of like hiring your top seller and putting them in a management position. I can tell you more times than enough, the person that might've been the worst seller or the middle of the pack was probably the best manager. Oh, really? Yeah. And to me, the best managers are the ones that have not just empathy, but the compassion and understanding of what gets their team going and helps you get to the finish line. Uh, And I, I'm like a huge LinkedIn fan, not only from their product, their management style and how they run, but I follow a lot from how Jeff Weiner would teach his employees. And he even has something where he has something called the compassion project where, and I follow what he does because I had a chance to talk to him about it. And like, he's totally sold me on, right? Like you'll run through walls for the manager that has genuine compassion for you over just empathy, get out of your own skull a little bit, get out of your own wall, stop fixating on what you need to do. Like if you can actually put yourself in their shoes and actually walk in those shoes, not just listen and acknowledge, but actually do the extra step. Um, That is how you're going to create an unbelievable family and team with whoever you work through any, any sales role, any position. And uh, following what he shared with me and those and how he thinks about management and managing with compassion. Mm-hmm. I think that is something I follow completely because I've had a lot of managers that manage by fear and that's the polar opposite of where I ever want to be. Uh, and, and I, I wasn't a fan of it. Is that common? And you know, you, you often hear coaches who do a hero of coaches who do that. Would you say that that's common in sports more so than in other areas or is it just a, as it just a management style that people use? It's a good question. I don't have enough. I don't have enough personal data to say that. Yeah. I don't have enough non-sports experience to say that. I I, I know enough people in the tech world where I've advised companies there or worked with them. And I know that this is the last way they manage. Um, Look, you got to hold people accountable. Uh, I'll admit to you too, like I've managed people where I had a review with them and I told them to give me feedback on me. And some of them told me to hold them more accountable. They wanted me to push on them a little more. I believe in in holding people accountable, but I also want to be clear of what I know they're capable of, right? Like, I don't want expectations that they don't have. Uh, But in sports, right, like, it's, it's hard for me to make that kind of a generic comparison. But I think you're probably more likely to see someone that's competitive manage with fear, probably out of stress reaction, right? Like they're just reacting out of stress and what they need to accomplish. And fear might work for a short period of time. And then it creates resentment, which is the reason why I don't, I don't believe in it. A lot of people, as you mentioned, a lot of people uh, try to work in for sports teams or look at people who work for sports teams and think it's kind of a glamorous, a glamorous uh, role or a glamorous opportunity. Would you say that that's the case right away? I know you said you worked in a room in a room with no windows. Is it always glamorous or no? <laughs> Definitely not always glamorous. Um, look, I think here's the thing. Any job you work in 
it's a job, right? Like you're you're paid to do something that's that's work. Some people love work. Some people love certain aspects of work, but there's gonna be a lot of aspects you you don't like. The glamorous things about working in pro sports, right? The access to the things that you generally have to pay for, that's pretty glamorous, Mm -hmm. right? To the ability to be able to go to games and go into clubs that you have to have certain seats to access, to be able to meet people, the amount of people you get to meet um, in that industry. I think that to me is is the glamour. Um, Whereas the other side, and I'll admit to you and everybody, what what gets to me is the people that care about the social scene and where you get to be and what you get access to and the internal fighting and access and people trying to find a way to get access to something that nobody else gets. Uh, those things kind of, they, they bothered me. They actually ate at me a little bit. And it was be, not because necessarily I cared about it, but then I would see my team caring about it and vice versa. And I think it created kind of a tough culture Hmm. because you can't give everybody access to those things. Uh, But then when you had certain people that shouldn't have access to it, finding a way to get to it, 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 it ate at me a little bit. I didn't appreciate that part of it. I, and I don't miss that part of it. Yeah. So what, what, go ahead. Go ahead. So I was going to ask you, and next, what what was your uh, what kind of led you to transition outside of out to, outside of sports over to Marble Bridge? Yeah, I've actually I've known the owner of this company uh, about eight years, and ironically, he started it at the same age I am now. <laughs> um, and he has two kids. He has two boys. I have two boys. Uh, we both are Jewish. Uh, there was just so many parallels in what he wanted in his life when he started this company and what I wanted today. And I think it was honestly probably about a year and a half ago when I knew I wanted to leave working in a pro sports team. And I, and I did it about, you know, five months ago, but my, I wanted to be pragmatic about what I was going to do. And, and to my point about, you know, being a part of my team, I just hired seven people coming out of COVID and I did not want to ditch them. I wanted them to have at least a full year of me. And, uh, we had a great year the last year I was, I was there. This was my, my way of honoring it, right? Like capsulating that we won. Um, but we had a great business year before any of that happened. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was rewarding. But, uh, what led me to come here was that I, I wanted more time with my kids and I wanted more upside. So we talk about all those perks you get in sports, right? Like I'm never, I'm not, I wasn't going to be an owner. I wasn't going to get equity. I wasn't going to get stock. I wasn't going to have grand opportunity in the bottom line to raise my salary exponentially until I got to probably the next two or three levels there or one or two levels. And even then, like, I didn't really want it because of all the other things that were bothering me about it. And having the time with my kids, it was probably working about 80 hours a week. Mm -hmm. I thought I would find something for me that would give me one of these two things, that I would have either more time with my kids or more upside. And uh, this was one of those opportunities that gave me both. And that was one of the things where I was just like, this is is the opportunity. This wasn't the industry I ever thought I'd be in. It wasn't what I thought I was going to be doing. But then I realized how translatable my skills were. I'm talking to businesses. I'm talking to early stage businesses as opposed to Fortune 1000s. I learned so much when I was there that I realized how this core of customers and then actually have more time with my kids and create a lot of upside for myself and for this business uh, to take it to the next level. And uh, it, it just seemed like too much of a perfect fit to me to not do it, even though it wasn't what I thought I would be doing because I always wanted to work in sports. Uh, I realized like the life I wanted was here. There's a life yeah. I wanted. now. That's and great. That's great. Congratulations. What uh, do you have? Have you kind of had a chance to figure out like a vision for goals that you ha- you've set for yourself? Or you just kind of, uh, you know, moving forward. Yeah. Great question. Uh, the, I, I'd like to say I got to learn every aspect of this business. Um, I've had people here tell me that it will take me six months to really feel like I got things going. And then I've had people tell me that it will take me five years till I feel like I know everything. 
Uh, but then I've seen people here 20 years in running into things that they've never seen before. So I, I think me learning constantly, being a sponge, never having too much of an ego, having an open mind, I think is what's what's going to get me going. Um, I have a goal this year of of having at least you know six companies that I work very closely with and that we're able to financially help. Uh, that is something I would like to have done in my first full year here. Uh, whether that's realistic or not at this point, I couldn't tell you, but uh, I think I think it is. How can people find out more information about Marble Bridge? Yeah, you go to marblebridge.com, go to our website. Uh, and I'm also got an open profile on LinkedIn. So if anybody ever wants to talk to me uh, and ha they have growth liquidity challenges in their business, uh, I'd be happy to talk to them. Even if I'm not the answer, I probably know someone that could help you. Final question for you. Uh, you may have alluded to this. Who, who has been a mentor for you? And what is the best advice you have received? Yeah, uh, we didn't. We actually didn't talk about this very much, but I have someone who's become a very dear friend of mine. Her her name's Jen Louie. Uh, she actually lives in Hawaii now. And, um, you know, she may not know that I view her as a mentor, actually, but th this was the best advice I ever got by action. And I just followed and adopted this policy when she did it with me. But she asked me to help a charity that she was a part of. So people internally at my company did not want me to do this, but I actually got us to donate a suite at the Warriors to her charity. And she was so thankful that we did it. She then made 10 intros for me over email to people that she thought would help me in my work. And I talked to her and I said, I couldn't believe you did that. Why did you do that? And she just said, I, I love helping people. You know, I always, you got to have a small network of people that you trust and that you help. And she just kind of, adopted me in that in that world and i kind of adopted this referral based sales process off of talking to her and learning from her um you fast forward you know parts of her family and her best friends are now my financial advisor my real estate agent like those are um ways that i thought about not only that compassion process i talked to you about but this is how i my how i operate as a business person process right I'm, I, I go in thinking about how I can be a giver first, how I can give something to somebody rather than asking them to do something for me. Very nice. And you know, what, what's interesting about that is the, the founders of Rise 25. Yeah. I had that same connection and relationship when we first talked uh, that they follow the kind of the same policy. They have the same ethos. And that's one that I, I, I follow, right? Like I will help people that have that mindset anytime. Yeah, definitely. They, they definitely do. And I appreciate that about them and about you. Hey, uh, Paul, it's been great to talk to you today. Thank you so very much. Appreciate your time. Uh, it's been great to hear your story and uh, all your thoughts. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.